Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at washingtech.com forward slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your Android, iPhone, Kindle, or MP3 player. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washing Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. The FBI agrees to help the state of Arkansas unlock an iPhone. President Obama blasts the media's political coverage. And Beverly Parenti is my guest. Days after the FBI announced it had figured out how to unlock one of the San Bernardino shooter's iPhones, the Associated Press reported that the FBI has also agreed to help a Little Rock, Arkansas prosecutor, a state prosecutor, unlock an iPhone and iPod. The devices in the Little Rock case belong to two teens charged with murdering a couple in Arkansas. The FBI withdrew its encryption case against Apple after the agency said it had figured out how to unlock the phones itself. You can find more at NBC News. At a Syracuse University event on Monday, last Monday, President Obama railed against the media and called on Americans to consider what we have each done to contribute to the toxic dialogue during the current campaign season. I know I'm not the only one who may be more than a little dismayed about what's happening on the campaign trail right now. The divisive and often vulgar rhetoric that's aimed at everybody, but often is focused on the vulnerable or women or minorities. The sometimes well-intentioned, but I think misguided attempts to shut down that speech. The violent reaction that we see, as well as the deafening silence from too many of our leaders in the coarsening of the debate. The sense that facts don't matter that they're not relevant, that what matters is how much attention you can generate. The sense that this is a game, as opposed to the most precious gift our founders gave us, this collective enterprise of self-government. And so it's worth asking ourselves what each of us, as politicians or journalists, but most of all as citizens, may have done to contribute to this atmosphere in our politics. I was going to call it carnival atmosphere, but that implies fun. As I said a few weeks ago, some may be more to blame than others for the current climate, but all of us are responsible for reversing it. The president went on to suggest that certain reporters seem to be more concerned about achieving ratings than promoting a civil dialogue. You can find out more at Newsmax. The Federal Communications Commission has passed proposed rules that require ISPs to do more to protect the privacy of their customers. The proposed rules require ISPs to obtain consent from its customers, disclose data collection, protect consumers' information, as well as report any privacy breaches. However, Reuters notes the rules would not prevent data collection practices. The rules also don't prevent ISPs from sharing customer data, nor do they apply to websites like Facebook and Twitter, since those companies fall outside the FCC's jurisdiction. You can find out more at Reuters. Finally, the FCC has expanded the phone subsidy program known as Lifeline to help subsidize broadband. The agency voted along party lines to subsidize broadband at $9.25 per month for families who qualify based on their SNAP and Medicaid eligibility. Starting December 1st, the subsidy will cover 500 minutes of voice per month and 500 megabytes of cell phone data, with subsidies for voice-only mobile to be gradually phased out. You can find out more about that from Tanzina Vega over at CNN Money. Stay with us. (laughs) 
for you, my dear listeners of the Washington Tech Policy Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You'll be amazed at how much time Audible will save you. How about Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson? You can download Losing My Virginity or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at washingtech.com forward slash book. My guest today is Beverly Parenti. Beverly is co-founder and executive director of The Last Mile, a nonprofit focused on providing education and training inside prisons that can result in gainful employment upon reentry, thereby reducing recidivism and helping redirect spending from prisons to education. Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan recently visited San Quentin Prison to spend time with inmates who are participating in Last Mile's coding boot camp called Code 737. On the day of his visit, Zuckerberg wrote on Facebook, quote, we can't jail our way to a just society, end quote. Last Mile's programming is one of the most requested prison programs in the U.S. It's the first program to offer a computer programming curriculum that teaches men and women to become software engineers. The Last Mile will be in six prisons, including two women's facilities by the end of this year, and expand outside of California next year. Beverly Parenti. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Joe. We're all too familiar with the fact that minorities comprise a disproportionate share of the American prison population, with white prison inmates comprising less than half or 47% of the total prison population in 2013, even though their population and their proportion of the U.S. population is nearly 30 points higher or 74%. Black inmates represent 34% of the total prison population, even though their share of the total U.S. population is more than 20 points lower than that at 12.6%. Michelle Alexander, of course, has done a lot of work on this. But we see the opposite trend in employment with minority representation in tech firms stubbornly in the single digits. So your organization, The Last Mile, TLM, has the problem right in its crosshairs. So congratulations on the great work that you're doing. Thank you. But I want to hear about your personal story, Beverly. What led you to this work and what gets you out of bed in the morning? Well, I lived in Marin and passed San Quentin State Prison on a daily basis, my commute to work. Or if I was on the ferry, we would be chatting away and out the window there at San Quentin State Prison again. But I had very little knowledge of anything to do with the prison system in California and had never been inside. And my husband and business partner, Chris Redlitz, was invited to speak to a group of men inside San Quentin about business and entrepreneurship. Because at the time, we were running a technology incubator in San Francisco called Kick Labs, where we were helping entrepreneurs develop their businesses and help get funding for um, their startup companies. And so he was intrigued about what was going on in San Quentin and agreed to go inside and speak with the men. I was expecting to be there for a short time. And lo and behold, several hours later, he came home and he was really excited to share his story. And I knew right away when he walked in the door and had that look in his eyes that I was in for something unusual. And he actually pitched the idea of starting a technology accelerator inside San Quentin based on the fact that he found the men inside to be so interested in business, extremely knowledgeable, and very excited about starting their own companies when they were free. Well, I thought he was uh, let's see what what's the right word that I could use on the show, but I, I thought it was crazy. You know, why would I want to go inside prison and spend my free time helping those who have wronged society? I had very little free time anyway, and I just didn't get it. But he was very adamant about his idea, and he. He knew then and there he, he was on to something. And he asked me just to have an open mind and, and try to have a uh, similar experience so that we could do this project together. We've launched many companies over the years of our business partnership and our marriage. 
And so the first thing I did was some research about issues facing our prison system today. And what I discovered uh, was really very upsetting to me. I learned that in the United States, although we have 5% of the world population, we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And in California, we are spending over $60,000 a year to house an inmate. Well, that doesn't really make much sense because the recidivism rate at the time was over 60%. Fortunately, it had decreased a little bit since then. But imagine that we spend $60,000 a year and then some to keep someone incarcerated. When they're released from prison, there's a greater than 50% chance that they're going to return. So what would we need to do to keep them from reoffending? I also learned that after one year, 75% of the formerly incarcerated are unemployed. And that was the inflection point for me. If I could figure out how to teach marketable skills that would result in gainful employment, I could, in fact, help reduce recidivism and free up tax dollars that we've been spending for incarceration to go towards education. And if we could spend more educating our youth, then we'd have a greater chance that they wouldn't, in fact, go down the generational path and generational cycle of incarceration in the first place. Wow, this is a vast, underserved community, clearly. And the interesting thing that you mentioned about your husband when he met the inmates at San Quentin is that it wasn't about their natural talent or ability. It wasn't about their pedigree. It really wasn't about anything more than their interest in business that resonated with him and you once you learn more. So it's just an inspiring, powerful story. Tell us a little bit more about TLM, how it got started, and your vision for the road ahead, Beverly. What do you hope for TLM and these prisoners and these inmates going forward? The next step was to go inside San Quentin and meet the men that Chris was talking about when he came home from his business presentation. And one of the guys said something to me that really stuck. And he said, I can no longer let 12 minutes of one day define who I am as a person, I saw a group of men who had transformed themselves. They had put so much work into becoming the person they want to be, not the person who was incarcerated in the first place. And they just wanted a chance for the future. They want to give back to their communities, take care of their families, and live successful lives. So, I agreed to join Chris, and it was in 2010 that we started the last mile at San Quentin to teach marketable skills that could result in gainful employment. Our first program was an entrepreneurship and technology business training program, where the participants tapped into their passions for what they would do if they could start a business when they're free. And we helped them put their ideas into a business plan. In fact, we use the business model canvas that is taught at the Ross Business School at the University of Michigan to help them write their plans, to develop a strategy, to write a plan with a technology component and a social cause, and ultimately learn how to pitch that business idea to a live audience at a demo day inside San Quentin. And at San Quentin, we had uh, we invited media, people from the business community, venture capitalists, CEOs of startup companies, authors, guest speakers. They came into various sessions, but they also attended Demo Day. And it, for many, was the best day of their life. But not everybody's an entrepreneur. And we really believe that having experience working within a company is really important knowing how to collaborate and work as a team. 
So based on our network and our experience in the Valley, we decided to include courses in front-end software engineering. So someone could have a great idea for an app. Well, now not only can they learn how to build it out from a business perspective, but potentially have the skills to build a working prototype. We're teaching front-end engineering skills so that those who successfully complete our program would be qualified as junior software engineers. And the reason we feel so strongly about teaching these skills is because this is a business vertical in which people are judged by the quality of their work, not the stigma of their past. It is predicted that in 2020, there will be as many as 1 million unfilled software engineering jobs. So there is an opportunity for those who are qualified to be gainfully employed. In June, we'll be launching a joint venture dev shop inside San Quentin, which will employ coding class grads as software engineers. They'll actually be working on projects for private businesses And the real key here is that they'll be able to earn a salary well above the average prison wage and re-enter society with savings rather than the $200 gate money that they would receive from the state. So we are enabling them to have relevant skills in an industry with a great demand, as well as having savings that they can use for rent, for food, for clothes, to support their families. And perhaps the greatest asset participants gain from the last mile is hope for the future. So this is a case study, you know, really in connecting the dots between people society doesn't expect much from and helping them reassimilate and assimilate back into society, into thriving careers, into careers that are in demand. And it's really kind of a template to draw talent from any talent pool that's underserved. If we can do it with inmates at San Quentin, we can do it with anyone. But what are the selection criteria, Beverly, for inmates who participate in the program? It's a rigorous process to get into the last mile program inside prison. And first we look at the individual and we gain confidence in the fact that they have transformed themselves, that they are no longer that person who was put behind bars in the first place. They're remorseful about their crimes and they want to right their wrong. They want to change and make sure that When they're released into society, they can give back to their communities, contribute to their families, and live a fulfilling life. That's the first part. There is an application process, of course, and then there is a, um, we check the C files for each individual to make sure that they haven't had infractions. We filter out for certain types of crimes, and we... Which crimes do you which crimes do you filter out? Sexual crimes, crimes against women, children, elders. Okay. Ultimately have an in person interview. For the coding class, we also administer a logic test. So we realize that, you know, some people may have had to drop out of school, didn't earn their GED, uh, they were supporting their families or they were involved in the wrong groups. Um, others may have not had the opportunity to go to college, but yet they still may have the aptitude to code. So we have started um, in, started administering a logic test just to assess their critical thinking and their ability for mathematical thinking, and this has been very successful. We also look at how they can collaborate in a group and make sure that their behavior remains free of any type of incident while they are part of the program. So any infractions that are occurred while they're part of the last mile means they could be dismissed from the program. 
Got it. And so now let's take a step back and let's can you can you give some advice? There are folks in the in the Beltway who want to connect their policy work with you know actually making a difference in communities. Can you give some advice on how to create an organization? What's the process for creating an organization like TLM, such as within juvenile local juvenile detention facilities? What would be the sort of the step by step? If you are interested in starting a program like this in your area, it is vitally important to understand the rules and regulations of the correctional facilities and look at those rules as opportunities and challenges, not as obstacles. Because over the past six years, we've learned how to navigate within the system and how to best administer programs that fit with the guidelines of the institutions. The first thing is to get buy-in from the administration and the desire to have a program that is really mirroring what is happening in the real world to prepare those who are going to be released back into society with skills that are, make them relevant we have been involved in San Quentin for uh, since 2010, so for six years. Our computer coding program, Code 7370, was created in 2014 in partnership with Cal PIA, which is the California Prison Industry Authority, and CDCR, California Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. So the three of us together are creating this amazing program. Beverly, it's been an absolute privilege having you on the show. So thanks once again for joining me. I just want to ask you a few more questions and then we'll close. Sound like a plan? Great. All right. On this podcast, we like to talk about policy and entrepreneurship, but also about what makes successful people like you tick. Tell us, Beverly, what are some habits, tactics, and apps that you use every day to stay on top of your game? Well, to begin with, every morning, I drink apple cider vinegar in water to maintain a great pH balance in my system, followed by a green shake and coffee with almond milk. I live by a paleo diet and I'm a tremendous fitness enthusiast. I love to work out. I practice yoga. I do high impact cardio. I take a lot of hikes with my husband and my dog, Boots, my very first dog ever. And that's how I start every day. Tell us the name of a book that you've read recently that you're recommending to basically everyone you meet. The Life We Bury by Alan Eskins. Not only was it a great story, a great read, but it was his first book. And as uh, an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur myself, looking at someone who starts a new career for the first time and has a home run hit like The Life We Bury, I highly recommend it. Thanks again, Beverly, for joining me. Do you have any final ideas you'd like to leave with the audience before we close? And where can folks find you online? So I'd like to just leave this one thought with everybody who's listening, and that is for those who don't believe that investing in the incarcerated population is a good idea, think about the fact that legislative changes and a shift in criminal justice mindset means that inmates are being released back into society in record numbers. Who do we want those people to be? And finally, I hope that listeners will follow our success on Twitter, at TLM, on Facebook, and my own personal story, at The Bev, on Twitter. Our website is thelastmile.org, and we appreciate donations of any size to help us continually fund the program today in California, but also to have the ability to license our curriculum to all the states. 
in the U.S. And you've been listening to Beverly Parenti, serial entrepreneur and executive director of The Last Mile, which provides education and training inside prison that can result in gainful employment upon reentry, thereby reducing recidivism and redirect spending from prisons to education. TLM has become one of the most requested prison education programs in the United States. It's the first program to offer a computer programming curriculum that teaches men and women to become software engineers. Engineers. TLM will be in six prisons, including two women's facilities, by the end of 2016 and will expand outside of California in 2017. Beverly, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Joe. That concludes episode 33 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I cannot do any of this without you, so thank you. And if you like the show, do me a favor and head on over to iTunes and give it a rating and review. It doesn't take long. You'll be in and out in 30 seconds, I promise. And I can't tell you how important these ratings and reviews are. So thank you so much for that. And thanks again for listening. I will see you back here next week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed.